Two and a half thousand years ago, a Greek scribe wrote out a dazzling list of wonders. Sights seen in the mind's eye, he said, can never be destroyed. To this day, that magic list still haunts the modern world. Amazingly enough, people still count this lovely old thing as one of the seven modern wonders of the world. The Golden Gate Bridge, a little rusty now, and more than half a century old, but still it seems counted as the best, counted as simply wonderful. Great, isn't it? That's what this series is about. It's about wonder. It's not about seven old things that hardly exist anymore. It's not stones and bones. It's about the archaeology of wonder. Look at this bridge. It's 50 years old now, and it's certainly not the biggest, but it still gets to be listed right at the top sometimes of the seven modern wonders of the world. Why is that? Well, I think it's because it embodies certain qualities that we so much admire today. These great spans, they talk of struggle and stress, of human dreaming, human achievement. That's what the Seven Wonders are all about. They were invented in a particular time in history. It was a time when man was looking around him, looking right through his world, thinking not what he could do for the gods, but what he could do for himself. And the Seven Wonders are a list of man's wonders. And they've always stayed that way, as a, as a symbol, if you like, of man's power on Earth. So those buildings, those old things that barely exist, run right through our society. They're in our cities. They even are in our body image, our own image of ourselves. Everything, that is, from the face of God to the body of Jane Fonda. So what exactly were these seven wonderful things? The Colossus that rose, they said, upon the Mediterranean Isle of Rhodes. The great gaudy temple built at Ephesus in Asia Minor. towering tomb in the city by the sea, the world's first mausoleum. The lighthouse called the Pharos to guide boats to the harbour of Egyptian Alexandria. An enormous statue of Zeus, king of the gods of Greece in ivory and gold. And on the far Euphrates, Babylon's fabled hanging gardens. And always and forever, on every list of wonders, the pyramids of Egypt, the oldest, largest and most accurate stone buildings ever made. Echoes of these ancient things are still inside our cities. At San Francisco, a pyramid stands inside the earthquake zone. The clock tower in the docks is modelled on the ancient lighthouse. A hotel 
is filled with images of hanging gardens built far away on the flat plains of Iraq to please an alien queen. From Cape Town to Las Vegas, all modern cities have their wonders in them. The seven ancient wonders are still a part of what a city is. So where on earth and when did this extraordinary list first see the light of day? Heidelberg in Germany holds the answer. Five centuries ago, the pretty little town held an extraordinary treasure. The greatest collection of ancient books the West has ever known. Most of it's gone today. It's all been broken up. There's still a few gems left though conserved here in the library of the university. You know, that is amazing. That's one of just a thousand or so old books that once held most of the wisdom of the Western world in them. You know, my first childhood memories of the Seven Wonders is sitting with my grandparents, looking at a book that was about that big, and it was a dictionary, and in the middle of it were these lovely old brown photographs. The Seven Wonders of the World. So that's my first memory of the Seven Wonders. That book is everybody's first memory of the Seven Wonders. Without that book, we wouldn't have the Seven Wonders. Of course, that book isn't as old as the list that's in it. This book is only a thousand years old, and it came to Europe in the baggage of a cardinal. It rolled around the continent for three or four hundred years, that it ended up here in the University of Heidelberg. Now it's so precious, you have to wear gloves and a face mask to look at it. So, here we go. The seven wonders of the world. Actually, the wonders are just one of 12 or 14 texts in this book. And look, there's the beginning of our text. Philo Byzantium on the seven wonders. Look, that's the introduction. Here we've got the chapter headings. There's the first one for the hanging gardens. Here's the second one here for the pyramids. Here's the third one for the great statue of the Olympian Zeus. And Phidias, the name of Phidias, its sculptor. So let's go back to the beginning of these wonders again. Look at those first lines in the book. He's telling us, he's telling us that everybody's heard of these seven wonders nobody has seen them, for to do so you have to go on a great journey. You have to go to the land of Sumer, you have to go to the land of the Egyptians, and you have to go to Greece. So let's then start that journey, go to the shores of the eastern Mediterranean. We're sailing out of the port of Halicarnassus, home of one of the Seven Wonders, sailing across the Mediterranean towards several others of them. You know, the Seven Wonders are a bit like sailors' tales. Some of them were well-known things in well-used ports. Others were out there somewhere, magic, mystical, garbled memories of things that nobody had ever really seen. Sort of things that keep travellers travelling, really. This, then, is the highway of the ancient world. There weren't many roads, and what there were, were very bad. So the Seven Wonders is a story, really, about things at sea on the highway of the ocean, and it's best explained on a map of the sea. Look, I'll draw you a wonderful map. Here, Greece, with its three points. We go round up to the Black Sea, Here's Turkey, swing round and down along the southern coast of the Mediterranean to Egypt. Now, as soon as you made this map, the seven wonders start to make some sense. They're not just seven things. Start at Halicarnassus, where we've just come from. Right, the home of the mausoleum. When the list was made, 
the mausoleum was 100 years old. We draw a circle of around 60 miles either side of that. We get another seven of the seven wonders, the great temple at Artemis at Ephesus. We get another of the seven wonders south, the great colossus of Rhodes. You could see that at sea, it was on an island. And then just 500 miles away, you'll come to the port of Alexandria and a lighthouse, the Pharos, was another one of the wonders. The other three, well, they're quite interesting if you look at the map too. They're a bit like a history lesson. They're telling you something about the ancient world, the more ancient world. That was beside rivers. So if you think of the great river Euphrates, the heartland of the ancient world running down there, there's Babylon, one of those sailor's tales that nobody ever saw. And on the Nile in Egypt, the pyramids. And in Greece, where two rivers met, Olympia, the heartland of ancient Greece, the place where this statue stood, one of the seven wonders, that seemed to symbolize the nation of ancient Greece itself. That then is where we're sailing, straight to the heartland of ancient Greece. Visiting Great Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the world, was planned like a splendid drama. Visiting the Parthenon in Athens still holds something of that drama's opening act. Phidias the sculptor worked here before he made the Zeus. Here, indeed, he held the dress rehearsal for that final mighty statue. So how did his drama work? Well, nothing is as simple as it seems. As you approach, the subtle curve of the temple steps gives the building added strength and dignity. And there are other tricks as well, all working to produce the same effect. The surprising end result, and this is the drama's first act, is that this great temple puts you at your ease. It seems to smile at you. I think the single most beautiful thing about the Parthenon is its scale. Not its size, it doesn't overwhelm you like the Seven Wonders would have done. It enfolds you, it somehow ennobles you, it makes you feel bigger, like you're walking with the gods, but it keeps you human. And the very stones themselves are beautiful. They're cut like jewels. They're warm in the sun and translucent like human skin. Inside the Parthenon stood the second act. Phidias's huge statue of Athena, made 10 years before he made the Zeus. It was as high as the restorer's crane. There's nothing left now, though. To see something of Phidias's magic, then, to see the drama's second act, you must go somewhere else. city they call the Athens of the South, to Nashville, Tennessee. That's the trick then. That's the surprise that Phidias designed for the visitors who came to see the great Athena and his Zeus of ivory and gold. It's a trick of scale and it comes over very clearly in this reconstruction. That statue standing in Athena's hand is as big as a person. First you're calmed and reassured by the temple's exterior. And then you're pushed into the uncertain darkness, into the frightening presence of a huge and towering god. It's a piece of pure theatre used by Phidias to set an aura of reverence, of fear, of faith and wonder around his statues. Judging by its ancient fame, the place where the trick worked best of all was the temple of Zeus at Olympia in southern Greece. The athletes of the ancient Olympic Games went into the stadium through this archway. Male Greeks competed here for 1,300 years and more the sacred games of Zeus. 
These footprints mark the place where a Victor's statue stood. 3,000 of them clustered round the altars and temples of almighty Zeus. The columns mark the buildings of the ancient Olympic village. Here, athletes and spectators made offerings together and they walked up the steps of Zeus's temple to see one of the wonders of the world. This was the heart of their culture, the grandest single figure of the ancient Greeks. Zeus's skin was made of plates of ivory, his hair of gold. Behind it stood the sacred veil from the temple in Jerusalem, taken in plunder. In front of it, a huge shallow pool of olive oil reflecting light. And for all that time, whilst the statue stood, men came and polished the ivory, a special body of men called Phidias's polishers. The statue was much loved. One visitor said, I can give you the measurements of this statue, but not its effect. Another visitor, Philo of Byzantium, who wrote upon the seven wonders, said the other six wonders we honour, but Zeus we venerate. Why? Why did this statue generate such deep emotion? Well, the answer was in its face, its beautiful, polished, ivory face. Phidias, says one critic, has given us the face of God. He has added to religion. And of course, Phidias had made his god in the image of a man. And so by making a new god, he had made a new man. And no artist really can do anything more than that. The statue's gone today, but amazingly, the workshop where it was made still stands. A strong room whose massive walls protected the tunnel more of gold the craftsmen used to make the statue, and the vast quantities of ivory tusks as well. Here, you see something of Phidias, the perfectionist. His workshop was built at precisely the same angle to the sun as was the temple. Phidias could see exactly how the light from the temple door would fall upon his statue. Here, then, he probably planned that pool of oil to reflect light up into the statue's face. The entire workshop is exactly the same size as the room in the temple. How precisely Phidias planned that dazzling change of scale around the Zeus. Such care, such perfection. The little sight museum at Olympia has an entire case from the excavation of Phidias's studio. And these belong to Phidias. There's a little cup there that actually has scratched on the bottom of it. I belong to Phidias. This is coffee mug. As for the rest, well, these are the tools and materials that produced one of the seven wonders of the world. Look, here's the ivory and bone that was the skin of the great statue. You can still see the saw marks on it. And these, well, these are the chisels and drills which cut the ivory and, and drilled it so that it would plate and hang over the wood. This little hammer here is very interesting. It's a jeweler's hammer. This was used on the cast gold. These moulds along the bottom were either used to cast gold in, which was then tapped exactly into shape, or perhaps to stretch ivory across. The ancient Greeks had a mysterious way of stretching and bending ivory. You know, when visitors come here and look at this case, I think the thing that most amazes them is the tininess of the materials and the tininess of the tools. I mean, this is really strange. The world's biggest indoor statue made with these tiny tools. The truth is, of course, they're jewelry equipment. The world's largest statue is made like a jewel. The end came with the Christians. In the fourth century, Zeus's Olympic Games were stopped by order of the Christian emperors. Phidias's studio was made into a church. Old Greece had gone.
The great temple had already fallen, its columns tumbled in an earthquake, its stone plundered to build a fortress against barbarian invaders. As the classical world was abandoned, the local rivers filled with yellow silt, and this it was that smothered the ruins of Olympia, preserving Phidias's tools and cup for us. Zeus's great statue had been carried off, taken away to Istanbul, or Constantinople as it was then called. In the days of the first Christian emperors, the city on the Golden Horn held one of the most extraordinary gatherings of art the world has ever seen. This brick circle marks the entrance of the palace of the pious Christian eunuch Lausus. He oversaw the closing of the temples. He collected pagan sculptures and stood them in his palace. The greatest prize of all stood at the end of the hall, the 800-year-old statue of Zeus. He stood there in a niche like the end of a church, as high as those trees. Here it stood for 60 years or so. Then it was destroyed in a city riot. In one way, though, it's still here to this day, for the great face of Phidias is Zeus, became the face of Christ omnipotent throughout the Eastern Church. This is the little church of Saint Saviour in Cora in Istanbul one of the most beautiful Byzantine monuments that survives, a theological jewel basket. And here's great Zeus on its walls. Zeus as Christ, a thousand years after the ivory original burned to ash in Laos's palace. There's St. Peter there, holding the keys of heaven. He's always shown like that. He's a man with a roundish face, blonde curly hair, and a short blonde beard. Now, Look at St Paul, he's always shown like that, completely different. Thinning hair, high domed forehead, long straggly beard and a great hooked nose. So anybody who came in the church would have known who they were from their traditional portraits alone. Now look up the top, seated on his throne, the Olympian Zeus as Christ. How on earth was it though that a pagan god came to stand as the very image of Christ. Well, for one thing, the Olympian Zeus in Laos's palace was a very wonderful thing in its own right. And for another, that same statue had already stood as an image of supreme divinity for almost a thousand years. the god of wine, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, will both dissolve your limbs, the ancient poet says, as will their only child, the gout. You know, lying here in this lovely old Turkish bath was actually a direct descendant of Greek and Roman baths. I can't help thinking how everybody else looks nothing like a Greek sculpture. And yet, you know, that idea of Greek sculptures and Roman sculptures representing somehow the ideal of physical beauty is still in us today. It's a long way from the truth, of course. You know, a little while ago, there was a research project that measured thousands of Italian and Greek airmen. And they measured them against classical statues, and guess what? They were nothing like the same at all. And again, if you're in Mediterranean lands and you see women who've worked in fields all their lives, they look more like Roseanne and they do like Madonna. 
And yet this idea in us that somehow there's this classical figure trying to get out is still very strong. And say aerobics and slimming and all the rest of it. Where on earth then did this amazing ideal of classical beauty come from and why is it still with us? The short answer, of course, is Greek sculpture. Its ancient images are still alive in us. Sculptors like Phidias had fixed the basic body image with statues like the Zeus. In the centuries that followed, though, sculpture became more animated, what many Westerners would still call more natural. Sculptures of women took on the looks and glances that are still today called sexy. And men went into lifelike action. Bestriding the entrance of a harbour, the legendary Colossus, the other statue of the Seven Wonders, became a famous image of this brand new, mobile type of sculpture. Above all, this was an image created by artists working on the portraits of a single man, Alexander the Great. Look at that wrinkle on Alexander's forehead. It's quite real, isn't it? Like it just furrowed his brow. The hair too, looks like there's wind blowing through it. It's all rough. And like real hair, you might think. Like this cheek too. Get down here and really look at it. You can see the sculpture's actually made four different movements across the face. One for the cheekbone, one for the nose, one for the mouth, another for the chin. He's really interested in skin, this guy. He's interested in skin stretching over the muscle. You get the feeling that if a fly settled on this marble, it would twitch. Alexander changed history. That's why this new type of sculpture is so appropriate. He changed history when he marched from Macedonia to India. He actually put human affairs at the front. There was a time when you could say that was before Alexander's conquest and after. Alexander had become a man of destiny in time. A man of destiny, of course, is an image. It's not a copy of flesh and bone. Just as Hitler had Leni Riefenstahl, just as Garbo had Hollywood, so Alexander has his image maker. He had a sculptor, a court sculptor, called Lysippus, and he invented the first image of man as hero. Did a lot for Alexander. One thing he did was to get the gentle curves of Greek sculpture and really throw them about. You can see this torso going like down, the legs go cross. It's a real man of vim and vigor here. I mean, this muscle, which shows that Alexander was a pretty powerful javelin thrower that's been accentuated so it clamps down on the thigh. But the biggest thing he did was to decrease the traditional size of the Greek head. That normally fitted into the body by about seven or eight to one. Lysippus made it 10 to one. Alexander's head got smaller. He ended up looking more like an American football player or Schwarzenegger or something. Lysippus really did a number on the face though. And he's made us a modern hero. I mean, he, this guy could go straight into the movies, couldn't he? It's a very strange story about how this particular look came about, because the real Alexander was truly long-haired, it seems, but rather short and a little deaf. So when he was surrounded by his courtiers, his typical pose was of actually slightly straining to hear what was going on above him. What Lysippus did, the classic icon maker, was to turn these defects into heroic poses. So the, the, the slight craning, the twist, has turned into a pose as if he was directing armies. And of course that has caused the mouth to curl slightly and open a little. That's what Isip has made for us here. He's really the first image of a star. And bits of this will survive in every star's picture from Byron to Brando to the dying James Dean. What moved these ancient artists as they made the first images of modern heroes? 
as they showed Alexander fighting, riding and hunting, as they cast the Colossus of Rhodes, which, after all, was made by a pupil of Lysippus and was nothing more or less than a 110-foot ad for the brand new man. Go to the great eastern cities built by Alexander's generals and successors, built in the Hellenistic age, and you'll enter the world of the Seven Wonders. Walk through these same great cities, and you walk through the minds of the first modern people. I'm strolling up the high road to Pergamum, one of the grandest cities of the Hellenistic East. These cities were completely incredible. Amongst other treasures, they had examples of all the seven wonders in them, from colossal statues to the founder's tomb. Pergamum, uniquely perhaps, lacked a lighthouse. Didn't need one, of course. It was nowhere near the sea. It had its own technological wonder, though. That was a 33-mile-long system of pipes that brought icy water from the top of a mountain to the heart of the city. It's a real technological wonder. This here is just a part of the outflow. This is really a river they've diverted. And look, there's the name of the potter, still on the pipe. Now, this Hellenism, this age of Hellenism, people usually don't regard it very highly, even the word Hellenism is pejorative. It means sort of like the Greeks. Now, think of ancient history. We are generally told that the beginnings of the modern world start in the classical period, right? By that, they mean two things. On the one hand, they mean the ancient Greeks, as wise as ours, in beautiful white togas, building the Parthenon, thinking beautiful thoughts, and generally rolling around the islands of Greece. On the other hand, a few hundred years later, the Romans pop up. Much more interesting, very cruel, interesting party throwers. And they also throw a, throw a few Christians to the lions and things. Between those two polarities, however, is Hellenism. And that really is the heart of the Seven Wonders. Hellenism is the first modern age. Seven Wonders, after all, are a range of aspirations and achievements of Im human imagination. This Hellenistic age is the first money economy. It's the age which really gave Rome its impetus and start. And also in the East, after a few hundred years, would see the birth of Christianity. The real wealth of the windy city of Pergamum could be seen from 50 miles away in the plain. There was a great column of black smoke which went up from the centre of this building. This was the great altar of Pergamon, the place where all the farm animals were slaughtered for the population to eat. The smoke, of course, was their bones and sinew burning offered on the altars to the gods, and the smoke went up for century after century over the consuming town. The altar's gone now, blasted out of the hill of Pergamum in Turkey in the 1870s by a German railway engineer and carried off to Europe. This then is what they've reconstructed in Berlin. They started making this about 180 years before Christ. If they started 50 years earlier, it certainly would have been one of the Seven Wonders. It was that famous. As it is, it just made it into the Bible as the throne of Satan. This, of course, is what people come to see, the magnificent frieze that went right round the whole building. It tells a story. It tells a story of how the gods, these marvellous, implacable, rule-giving figures fought the giants who used to run the world and won. The giants are losers. They're twisted, they're in agony. They're really the root of modern art. Everything from Francis Bacon to Robocops here. And some of them look like this man. Look at him. That's Alexander. His head slightly turned, his mouth is a little open, his hair's awry. He's a human hero caught in the hands of the gods and he's suffering. 
Here, the world that made the Seven Wonders is not listing its achievements, just telling us about the brutal struggle to achieve. You feel like you're in a Roman arena watching gladiators and wild animals killing each other. The nerves are at full stretch. The drapery licks around the figures like fire. There's Helios, the same god as the Colossus, racing in frenzy in his chariot across the sky. The Colossus of Rhodes, though, stood somewhere between this frenzy and Phidias' calm images of Zeus. What was it really like? Out to sea, wrote Philo of Byzantium. Out to sea lies the island of Rhodes, which the sun raised into the light. Here, ancient writers say, once stood the great Colossus, the second sun standing face to face with the first. It was made about 280 BC by the sculptor Caris, one of Lysippus' pupils. Though it fell down after only 60 years, they say it was just as impressive as a ruin. Finally, the fallen statue was broken up by Arab soldiers and sold in Syria for scrap. In modern times, no one's seen a trace of it. Classical scholars say the statues like the Colossus usually stood beside a temple. At Rhodes, Helios' temple stood on the hilltop in the middle of the town, but they've not found a trace of the Colossus there. They did uncover a single vital clue, though. Huge city walls from the time of the Colossus running through the town and down into the port. These prove that Rhodes harbors are largely artificial. This means that a colossal figure might well have been built on the end of this brand new harbour wall, just as they were in other ancient man-made harbours. The Colossus couldn't have possibly spanned the harbour entrance though, as pictures of it show. It would have had to have been a quarter of a mile high for that, and neither the metal nor the stone of such a giant striding statue could ever sustain such massive strains or the force of winter gales. Today, the medieval fortress of St Nicholas stands at the end of the harbour wall. It's half made of ancient masonry. You know, the most interesting thing in this little fortress are these blocks of marble. If you look at them very, very closely, you can see they were first cut by Greek sculptors, ancient Greeks from the time of the Colossus of Rhodes. Of course, the medieval people have taken them up and reused them about the place. This one, for example, has had a great slot cut in it to take the planks of a drawbridge. But the most interesting thing about these blocks is they're not square. They're actually segments of a 17-metre circle. Each one's got a very slight curve on it. Now, 17 metres is the exact dimensions of this little tower at the centre of the fortress. So what looks like has been happening here is that the medieval people took over an ancient building, perhaps even built straight onto the foundations, and jumbled all these ancient stones up. These, then, may be fragments of the very base of the Colossus of Rhodes. How was it ever made? Philo, who lived when the Colossus still stood, says that it was built like a house. Fragments of other giant statues show that they were built as skillfully as Phidias' Zeus, bit by bit, on frames of iron and stone. The skin of the Colossus was cast in sheets of bronze. As for its pose, 
The truth is, we don't know if it was standing up, sitting down, or even driving a chariot. Chances are, though, there's a hint of it in statues like these. A standing bronze with some of the life and grace of Lysippus' finest work for Alexander. This marble giant is a copy of another colossus, one made by Lysippus himself. The Colossus of Rhodes, though, was not tired and overblown like this poor old Hercules, but a young man with a handsome face, and that gives us another clue. This beautiful head was found on the island of Rhodes. Now, the first interesting thing, as far as we're concerned, these holes that run around the back of his head, there's a whole lot of them, and if you should stick a wire or a bronze piece of metal covered in gold in them, you'd find they made a perfectly symmetrical burst like the rays of the sun, just like the rays around the head of the Statue of Liberty, or indeed, around the statue of the god Helios. He always wore a sunburst. So this, then, is the head of a statue of Helios, the god of the Colossus from the city of Rhodes. And within a hundred years or so, it's the same date as the Colossus. Let's look at the face for a minute. Look at that slightly open mouth, the twisting neck, the open eyes. That's Alexander. That's the same school of sculptors that made the Colossus, made that image of the king, and it goes right through the world. Now this Helios, he's rather an interesting god. He's not a Greek god, really. He's Asian. And he came to power, really, in the great cities of the East, in the Hellenistic cities like Pergamum and Rhodes. Now this Eastern god, just like Jesus Christ, another Eastern god, goes from these Eastern cities straight to Rome and the heart of the empire. If you go to modern Rome, you'll still find images of the ancient sun god. When Christianity was beginning, the links between the Eastern gods were very close. Just like Christ, Helios the sun god was also the god of judgment who cast sinners from the light. And Helios too was born on December the 25th. And we still worship on Sunday, the day of Helios. Still today, deep in the church, under the altar of St. Peter's, there are memories of Helios and some of the oldest images of Christ. In an ancient catacomb close by St. Peter's tomb, a gold mosaic shows us Christ as Helios rising in his chariot. This risen Christ has Alexander's twisting neck and straggling hair and slightly opened mouth and the fiery flames that once flicked around the head of the Colossus have become a Christian halo. Here then, echoes of the ancient wonders entered the Christian world. And still today, our modern cities are filled with half images of Zeus and the Colossus, and all of them, as all of us, modeled on those splendid ancient images of ivory and bronze and gold. 